Joining us this morning, Tatiana Jordan. Tatiana Jordan. I get the name right. Jordan. Tatiana. Tatiana. Okay. It's Tatiana Jordan. A term that people are very uh, familiar with is PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but you are talking uh, about something a little different. Um, so tell us about it. Well, people have heard about PTSD, mm -hmm. because especially around the military and people who go through a traumatic life event. Mm -hmm. But a few years ago, AARP Magazine did an article on me, and I didn't know why they wanted to talk to me. I wasn't ready to be in AARP. <laughs> But they presented something to me which was really interesting. They said, you're really an example of PTG. And I said, what's that? And they explained it. And I, it's post-traumatic growth syndrome with the S on it. And they said they wanted to use me as a sort of an exper experience around it because I felt people grow from a traumatic life event. Yeah. And they wanted to understand the strategies that I used to do that where a lot of people have gone a different direction. Absolutely. I mean, the difference between PTSD and PTGS is life-changing and life-affirming. So, I mean, tell us everything. Well, I, I've had the honor to go to places like Fort Hood in Texas. I went to Oklahoma after tornadoes. I went to Eastern Shore, North Carolina, Super Shore, Sandy. And one thing I found out is this. People like me get taken care of. I'm out there, right? But a lot of people who go through these traumatic life events go into a deep depression. Understandably. And, and yeah, they, they don't know how to handle it. And then I started talking to a lot of people in the military, and especially lately, people in law enforcement. Law enforcement's having a real difficult time right now. And I share them the, some of the strategies I used. Candidly, I didn't tell know until the movie Sully that Captain Sullenberg actually had PTSD. Yeah. He, was, he was being challenged and there's a lot of things. We knew something was going on, but we didn't understand the depth of it. Mm -hmm. So I, when I talk to the military and people who've gone through this, I share my strategies. And one of them is how to manage your mind through all this. And people say, what does that mean? Well, there's three ways to really manage your state at any moment. First is the way you move your body. Just moving your body can change the way your whole body reacts and endorphins and how you think about things. The second way is through your internal dialogue or the questions you ask yourself. Most people who go through a traumatic life event ask a question like this, why does this happen to me? Why does this always happen to me? And they say it so much and get so deep in their mind that all of a sudden they're going from uh, I'm okay to depression to potentially PTSD because they, they just, it gets so ingrained. Yeah. Where a question I asked myself after the plane crash was, how can I add value and enjoy the process? And I tell people, enjoying the process was probably the most important part of that when I started asking myself. And people say, well, why is that? Well, I said, well, just think about when people go to work. People go to work every day, they add value. How many people hate their jobs because they're not enjoying the process? Right. People who are truly fulfilled in work are enjoying where they're at, enjoying the people they're with. So they're growing. Instead of people who are miserable all the time, then all of a sudden it gets in their mind, why am I working here? All of a sudden, that's why they go depressed. But the third way you can manage that is what you focus on. And that's how Captain Stellenberger managed that day in the plane, where he couldn't get up and move his body, and he had a lot of things going on, and you heard maybe the, the air traffic controller interaction on the movie Sully, but he had to focus. He had to take all those years of experience and focus in on that one moment in time, like he said in the movie, I had 208 seconds to determine my whole career. And he had to focus. So there's three ways to manage your state at any moment. And that's how, number one way, you can actually grow from a traumatic life event. Traumatic life event. But the second way is probably more important, is around the meaning you attach to it. Right. Where a lot of people attach the meaning is, you know, it's a negative experience. Well, we've had people on the plane had the same experience. I was in the green room on the Good Morning America with a lot of passengers. And one passenger got very upset um, that day. He said, I never want to see you people again. This has been horrible for me. And, all of a sudden, people were asking, well, what's, what's going on? Well, he yeah. lost his job. He was, they went through a traumatic life event. Everything was stacking on him. Right. So the meaning he attached to that was total negativity. Mm -hmm. Well, the meaning I attached to that was, this is a blessing. This has helped me expand my life to meet people that I never would have the opportunity to meet. So I took a whole different, a whole different approach right. of my meaning that I attached. So if you do those two things, number one, manage your state. And second, attach a positive meaning. You can change the meaning to anything. You know, meaning, meaning is basically is the emotion of your life. You can attach anything and, and either be positive or negative from a, any experience. So those are two things I actually teach and t tell people about because I think there's so many people in pain right now. Yes. And this election has caused so much pain in people, which is abstract. Nothing has happened. 
really. But they hear the words. Their internal, internal dialogue is all of a sudden changed. Now they're managing their state this way or this way. Well, you know, that second point you made about managing your internal dialogue is so important. Um, a very wise woman uh, who lives here in Atlanta, Alicia Freeman, told me that your brain is a literal, literal organ. So if your brain is a literal organ, whether you are reasoning or not, what you're telling yourself becomes fact. And from there, there are a lot of ramifications that, that happen because of that. Um, so it's very, very important to keep in mind what you are telling yourself really does impact you, whether you like it or not. <laughs> I totally agree with that. And take it one sort of one depth down, where one of the things I talk about in my book, Moments Matters, about sensory acuity, where people communicate in different ways. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that in my marriage for about 15 years, where I'm a video, visual kind of guy. I use my hands, I, I talk visually, when my wife is total auditory. Hmm. So there were times in our, in our marriage where we were challenged because I was talking a visual, she was talking auditory, she wanted to talk, I just, just give me the facts, I got it. That doesn't jive. Wow. So take, take this down, that we talked about the internal dialogue, uh -huh. to that level. How do you speak to that person? And that's how, when I talk to people, I want to try to see, are they visual, auditory, or kinesthetic? Mm -hmm. And I try to match what they're doing, because I've learned the strategy on how to match that kind of modality. That's and huge. Th and this changed everything in all the relationships that I've had in my life. That one little distinction, being able to understand how people communicate, has helped, helped me become a top producer in sales and probably helped me that day on the plane. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about that. Um, you have this book, Moments Matter, uh, which is incredibly impactful. Um, how one defining moment can create a lifetime of purpose. And that totally speaks to the PTGS that you're talking about. Instead of going into a hole because of a traumatic life event, um, you're using it to reach people on a global scale. So let's start with how this moment has created a lifetime of purpose for you. Well, I would sort of put it in perspective, this moment where I was just going through life. I was successful. I was doing my thing. I had a family. Everybody's healthy. But all of a sudden, something happens like this. And you're that final moment. I think I really changed in that final moment. Right when he said, you know, this is your captain, brace for impact. At that moment is when I realized, I think everybody on the plane realized this is probably pretty serious. Mm. He used the word dire. I used the word serious. But at that point, you basically have one minute. And you don't know whether you're going to have your life or you're going to go to a different life. And that's when all of a sudden I tell people, I had this experience, I'll share this. My pastor at that point's wife was in Haiti. She was in earthquakes in Haiti. And she was having a real difficult time. And we had this conversation one-on-one -on -one in the room. And what was that last moment like for both of us? And it was very similar. Where my last moment, I had so total clarity in my life. I saw things in my life I had never seen for 30, 40, 50 years. And I saw, it was so clear to me. All of a sudden, I knew what my mission was at that point. If I survive this, I've got to go out and share this to inspire people that you too, if you have the right mindset, you can do these things, you can survive anything in your life. And that's the moment that changed everything for me. Now, there's a lot after that, trying to get off the plane, water going down, and there's a lot of things after that. But that was the defining moment for me, that last minute. It was roughly 60 to 70 seconds after he crossed over the bridge is when he crashed into the river. So other people were doing their own thing. I was praying, I was, but that's the moment of clarity. And she had the same moment of clarity when she was basically under a house in an earthquake. She said she didn't know when she was gonna get out. And she got out and she couldn't get, get back to the United States. And she said that moment though, when she thought she was gonna die, she said it was like everything opened up for her. She knew what her mission in life was, defining that moment. So you mentioned a pastor. So I'm assuming yep. uh, you have a faith. Um, I do as well, and uh, my hope is always that if, God forbid, or Lord willing, I am put in a moment like that, that I will have an inexplicable amount of peace, regardless of the tor turmoil going on around me. Did you have peace in that moment? That last moment, I totally had peace. Yeah. Because I knew one of two things were going to happen. Either I'm going to come back alive and I could serve, or I was going to a better place. Yeah. And I knew at that point, it was, it was out of my control. Right. You know, the only thing I control is my mind. Right. And then we talked about before the internal dialogue. Yes. And that's the only thing you can control. Everything else is out of your control. And that's when you know you have really faith, real faith. So when you have no control. And I talk about it in my talk about the lady who has a baby who basically didn't know what to do. And we yelled at her to get her, broke, break her mind up so she could focus. 
And she had to have faith to give her baby up to somebody to get, help other people get off the plane because she was in the middle of the wing. So faith has, a, has, has it was played a tremendous part in this. So I think this was sort of a calling for a lot of people that, you know, I'm still here. There's a, there's a greater being handling this. You don't have any control. You think you have control? You don't control much in this world. You really don't. You don't. <laughs> and it opened my mind. It's like, you know what? The biggest change I tell people in my life since this happened is my worldview's changed. Where I was probably pretty judgmental, like most people are. I made a judgment pretty quick. You know, what you look like, where you came from. Okay, now I've got it sizing you up. But all of a sudden I realized after this happened, I don't know people's backstories. You have no idea what they have gone through and what they're going through. Exactly right. Because there were things that happened on that plane. Is why did this guy do this? Why did this girl do this? And all of a sudden I started thinking, oh, I don't know where they came from. They may have a whole different story that can't really cause them to take that reaction. And all of a sudden I said, maybe if I'm less judgmental, maybe if I don't judge, maybe that'll open up a relationship. And all of a sudden it opened up a relationship with people I would never had ever had an interaction with. And I'll give you a perfect example. It was two years ago, actually this month, I shot, a, I did a piece for a documentary movie called Be Who You Are. Mm -hmm. Very cool. They, you know, I, I sat, I did it filmed me, they came to Charlotte, went to Philadelphia, the whole thing, right? So a couple months later, they're ready to go do this release. I get a phone call from the producer. Would you come and be, be a part of this? The red carpet, I say, hey, I'm cool with that. He goes, I want to give you a heads up. We're going we're to debut this at a gay, lesbian, transgender film festival. I said, okay. So I had sort of sat back and thought for a second, okay, I've never done this, right? Yeah, I could be put in a very awkward position. I don't know how to handle So I, I guess I'm coaching. But I, I went to this thing. I did it, I did it, and I knew I was going to get interviewed. And one of the people asked me, well, you know, were there any preferences going on the plane? You know, I knew they were coming from. It's like, does anybody not thought were out there first where, you know, maybe, maybe a white person was going first or a straight person? I said, no. I said, everybody on that plane did that day, it didn't matter whether you're gay, lesbian, white, black, it didn't matter. Because everybody was in for everybody else. You're all souls. We all, we all checked our egos at the door and said, you know what, we're all here together. We're going to die together or we're going to live together. And I told him, I said, and then all of a sudden that person sort of looked at me, because it was a transgender person. And I sort of looked at me. And I said, yeah, no one judged anybody that day. And after the moment, I sort of flipped my mind, I was like, you know, that's the biggest change I've had. I would have never done that before. I would have never been a part of that because of my prejudgments. Right. But now, I do anything, you know, because people are people. Everybody's got pain in their life. Everybody wants to be inspired, and that's why I do what I do. I'm, like, trying not to cry. This is, this is so powerful and so impactful. And the fact that I get to sit here with you and just pick your brain and have a real authentic conversation with you is, is such an honor. Um, talk about your life leading up to that day. Where'd you grow up? What'd you do? Your career, your family, all of that. I grew up outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, Midwestern kid, right? Very athletic, Boy Scouts, did pretty much everything everybody did in the 60s, right? <laughs> I, I was a 60s kid growing up, and uh, we moved to Virginia, uh, which was a new experience. My dad got transferred, so I had to start over again. But then, so I had to start from scratch, and I did really well. You know, I, I was athletic and did all that. But then I wanted to play college football. And I wanted to play for Ohio State because I had a friend who played at Ohio State. Great and, school. But it was 1979, and that's when Ohio State was in the Gator Bowl, and, and you know, Woody Hayes uh, cold cocked somebody from Clemson. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my mom's looking at me and said, you really want to play? You want to be a, a big fish in a small pond or a small fish in a big pond? I said, I better just be a fish someplace else. <laughs> so that's how I got to James, <laughs> excuse me, James Madison. <laughs> and I had a great, great life there. But, you know, I learned, it was a great learning experience in college. But I started my career in Richmond. I was in a hotel restaurant, and people said, well, why had to get a hotel restaurant? That wasn't my major. My major was international business. Well, I flunked out in that pretty much, because every interview I did, I couldn't speak sp solid Spanish. And I figured out, you have to be bilingual, yeah. right? So, okay, I got a lot of things I gotta learn. My dad gave, he did this for everybody in our family. You have 30 days when you're out of college, you get out of the house. You better have a job, you're out. The 30 days came, and I didn't have a job. And my mom was begging him to let me stay, and my dad's, so he said, I'll get you a job. So he got me a hotel restaurant, which is probably the greatest thing in my life because I knew nothing about it. I had to start from scratch again. So everything in my life was starting from scratch. So I got into the sales after I got done with that career. And they always ask me, what part of sales you want to be in? Well, I always start from scratch. Just, give me, just send me out there. So they gave me South Carolina, and I opened up that for another company. And all of a sudden, it grew. And I became very successful in sales. What were you selling? 
uh, I was anywhere from data processing services, this is back in the 80s, uh -huh. all the way to consulting to later software. But all through this time, I did something that changed everything. And it came from a discussion I had with my mentor. And my mentor's name was Bill. And I didn't know, I, this was back in the late 80s. And I was out of college, you know, thought a lot of myself, pretty confident, right? And I found this guy, Bill. And Bill sort of took me under his wing. I didn't know anything about Bill. But Bill, because the first time I met him, he had a flannel shirt. He drove a pickup truck. So I prejudged, right? Right. There's Bill. Yep. What I found out from Bill is he owned 80 movie theaters in North and South Carolina. <laughs> he was a multimillionaire, and he's like the <laughs> Sam Walton of Charlotte. So also, I've got this guy on my hand. I'm like, so I had this mentor, and he, I kept asking questions. And he told me if I want to be anything in my life, put myself around the peer group that I want to be like, then they'll elevate you to that standard. So I went to a business seminar. And that's what everything started changing. I went to a business seminar and I've all of a sudden started doing really well. I needed more. So I went to a Tony Robbins event. And all of a sudden, about a year and a half later, I was volunteering for Tony Robbins, doing his event, but I became on his security team. And I became the assistant head of security and all of a sudden I was the director of security for Tony Robbins. Wow. So I traveled with Tony every place. And not only with Tony, but all the people he hung with. And that's pretty, pretty cool stuff. But I learned so much. That's what gave me the edge. Because I was learning things that other people would, had to pay millions of dollars for. And I was just around it, absorbing it all. So that, I can tell people, on that day on the Hudson River, pretty much everything that I learned came into play. What are some of those key learnings? So one of the key learnings that day was about how to, how to break people's patterns. And I talked about the lady with the baby on the wing. Mm -hmm. She was sort of stifled. She had two kids, a three-year-old on the boat, a three-month-old she was holding on to. Mm -hmm. She's standing in the middle of the wing, 11 degrees, 36 degree water, plane just crashed by herself. And she wasn't moving and there were people behind her. I was hanging out the door because I couldn't get off the plane. There's no room on the wing for me. So I yelled at her because one of the things I learned from Tony is how to break people's patterns. Because people get locked yep. and they can't make a decision. Right. And this, I use this in business all the time. I just do something radical. So I yelled at her, I said, throw the baby. <laughs> throw the baby. I knew she, what? Yeah, she's like, look at me, he's like, what? <laughs> but I got her attention. And all of a sudden another lady grabbed the baby and she got off the wing, some people started walking down the wing. So I use breaking patterns. Power, we talked about state management, focus, right. internal dialogue. That came from what I learned with Tony, because you know, if you get in a tough situation, which that was probably one of the toughest situations I'll ever be in, mm -hmm. and most anybody will ever be in, is you better be able to manage that, manage your mind. Yeah, and the art of communication, where I had to go sometimes visual, I had to go sometimes auditory with people. You know, that lady on the wing was auditory. She was just locked. She wasn't seeing anything but her baby. But until she heard something, a command, that's when she took an action. I used sensory acuity. And that's how this book came about. All these things that I used that day and learned, I employed. And that's one thing that, when you talk to Tony Robbins, one of the things I think Tony wants more than anything else is people who are around him and go to his seminars and things, employ the things you learn. Most people don't. No. They just go for the energy. Right. I actually employed it. And so Tony did a very nice video for, on me after we spoke that night in the hospital, which is out on YouTube, which I was very honored that he said the things he said. But he, I think he, he was really proud that I employed what he taught me in the most critical time when all stuff's breaking loose and you have no control. You know, leadership stepped up, right? All of a sudden, you know, the one thing on the right side of the plane where I went out, there was no crew. If you saw the movie, the crew went out to the left side of the plane. So leaders had to step up with zero skills, zero, zero experiences. But leaders have to step up. Yep. So you learn how to leadership, right? Step up in that moment, right? Teamwork. Sometimes I talk about yet, sometimes you have to check your ego at the door. And a lot of times I wouldn't do, a lot, of, a lot of A type of personalities will not do that. I gotta be the guy out front. Right. Sometimes I'm not the guy with the right skill set. And I, I, I employed that that day. Yeah, sometimes I just step back, the other people take, take control of the things I can control in my mind and control my outcome. Absolutely. So there was so many things that I employed. So I, I think that underscore of my career, being with Tony, was sort of giving me the prep for that moment to be able to take it and say, okay, now's the time. So after head of security for Tony, what happened? Well, the plane crash happened. Tony called me in the hospital and he was coaching me the whole time because I was getting media requests and things were just coming at me left and right. And I was still working and I still had a family. Mm -hmm. And I was still head of security. I was just getting inundated, but Tony was coaching me the whole time. So I was still working with Oracle, doing what I was doing with him, still doing okay, you know, all right. 
but you know, it came a time and he had a seminar in Secaucus, New Jersey. And I was head of security, so I was still responsible for making sure it all happened. Yep. So I called his assistant and said, listen, I'll just give you a heads up, I'll be there, but I'll probably have more media there than Tony will. And she starts laughing, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, you gotta remember, this happened in New York, in the river, three miles away. So when I show up, CBS showed up, right? <laughs> and followed me the whole weekend. I was useless to Tony. Oh gosh. So a year later, Tony and I had a sit down in Chicago. He said, maybe it's time for you to take off. Right. This is your time, I will, I will find somebody else, take this and, and go, go impact somebody's life. And that's when everything started taking off for me. When he said, go for it. This is your time, go for it. You can impact people's lives. So it wasn't immediately after the incident, it was about a year. About a year after, we were in mm -hmm. Chicago. And we had to sit down. Because the one thing being with Tony, when I pick him up at the airport, every time I pick him up at the airport or the helipad was, are you still working for that company? He kept telling me, he said, you cannot be truly free in your life unless you employ yourself, you take responsibility for yourself and your actions. He said, why are you still working for that company? And I make excuses. And you can only make up so many excuses, right? And he, he can see right through it. You're not telling the truth. But this, uh, he's, I might say, this is your time. Do it. And finally, my wife gave me permission, and I did it. And it's been a tremendous change in my life because now I can impact more people now I, all over the world than I'd ever be able to impact selling software. Mm -hmm. You have the freedom yeah. to employ you, your unique calling and unique abilities. In all different areas. Yeah. There's business, contribution, faith. I get to impact so many people on so many levels. It's, it's truly amazing to me that, that this opportunity I've been given. And I think God opens pathways for people. And you either take them or you don't. If you don't take them, my belief is he may not ever offer to you again. Isn't that terrifying? That he, may only, he may give you this opportunity. I'm opening this up for you. Because my minister at that point, he, um, and this sort of, that sort of came to me at this, when we were, I spoke at 9-11 in Charlotte that next year, which is very, I was honored. I mean, it was a huge honor. Huge. Huge. And my, my minister had never seen me speak in public. He saw me speak in church, but never in public. So come on, come out with me. So he saw me speak. We were walking back to the car together. He goes, he said, I had, I had a sort of eye-opening experience while you were talking. So well, tell me, he goes, it's sort of like you went in the water one person and you came out a different. He said, in the Methodist faith, we don't get rebaptized. But it's like, all of a sudden, it came out, everything opened up and you're taking it. He said, you have a speaking ministry. Do never give this up. And that was something, okay, that was from that perspective. And then Tony told me the same thing later that year, I was like, okay, I've got it, I've got it. Something that has been true of my life experience and I've said over and over again in both private conversations and in public platforms is that God opens doors where there are walls. And some of the lowest points in my life, I didn't see a way out. I didn't see what good lied ahead. Um, there was a wall, but God opened a door. And I feel like that's a, a theme that, is, that resonates throughout a lot of lives. I think most um, people's lives. Yeah. They, all I can see is that they don't see a window, they see a door. Yeah. And all of a sudden there's windows open over here and somebody's gotta slap you across the head and say, you know what? <laughs> it's like that story where I've, told, I've given you all these opportunities, <laughs> right? Just, just do it, right? Yes. And I think that, I think God, God loves everybody. I, my, this is my personal belief, whether you believe it or not. I think God loves everybody. and He gives everybody these opportunities. Some people have that internal dialogue going, it's like, it's never for me, I can't do it, I can't. I can't. I can't. And if you hear me talk, the one thing, if you ever hear me talk, I talk about my mother's, the word we could never say in our house is can't. That's right. And my mother would, would always say, if you can't do it, you're gonna do it. My mom's worldview, after all these years, I figured it out. If you can't, you must. That's right. That's her view, worldview, impacted all of her kids, because all of us have the same beliefs. You know, don't tell me no, I, I can get it done. I just gotta figure a way out. And you gotta be resourceful. And that's what this book's about, about how to be resourceful. You know, when all stuff's hitting you, Use all the different resources that you have. You don't think you may have one pathway. I give the example on the plane. Because what happened on the plane when we hit, some of the seats broke back. Mm. Now, at that moment, my thought, now I wasn't resourceful though. I'm, I'm not the resourceful guy at this second. <laughs> you, got, you got two exits up here, you got two exits up there. Also, other people start getting on top of seats and walking down seats. Now you have four or five pathways out of the plane. That's how people got on the wings in about two to three minutes. Where everybody, if they just weren't resourceful and didn't think that way, I gotta get to the aisle, get up and get out. Right. And also you have 150 people trying to get to one place. It doesn't work. 
this, that's what this book's about. The biggest picture about this book is how to be resourceful with all these resources that you don't think you have, whether sensory acuity, leadership, anticipation, persistence, and employ them at that critical moment, that one moment in which everybody in, this, in their life is going to have that one moment. It may not be a plane crash, it might be cancer, it might be a fire, it might be a flood, I might have lost a baby, mm. right? It could be anything. Right. Everybody's going to have that critical moment. What are you going to do at that moment? How are you going to respond? I love that. What are you going to do? How are you going to respond? Um, you're very involved with the Red Cross. Um, how did that come to be? I always was giving blood. I did my thing. But there were three Red Cross experiences I had that day and the next day on, during the miracle on the Hudson, which impacted me. Um, but still didn't stir me to the point to the next step. Mm -hmm. But what happened was, is the lady who was in charge of the Red Cross in Charlotte called me and asked me if I would speak at her fundraising event. Now, of course, she helped my family. She was the one at the, at the airport helping my family get through this while I was trying to figure out what was going on with my life. Oh, my gosh. So she's helped my family. So, of course, I'm going to do it for her. So I show up, and all of a sudden, they went from about 150 people to about 400 people and raised a lot of money. And so she and I became good friends. So she asked me to come speak at another event in Charlotte. It was for the Tiffany Circle. Mm -hmm. It's for the ladies who donate a significant amount of money. Mm -hmm. And I did this, you know, I'm, I'm all in. But there was a lady there, and her name's Melanie Sablehouse. And Melanie was the head of the Tiffany Circle for all the Red Cross. She heard me and said, I want you to speak in the our national conference. And she said, whatever it takes, just get, you gotta get there. So here I am, it's me and 450 women. Not a bad ratio. It's <laughs> not it, bad. It was not bad, it was actually, I was the only guy in the room, so I stood out a little bit. So I, got, I get up speaking, all of a sudden, women, didn't, they didn't know who I was. And then I start talking, and all of a sudden you see people, the mascaras running, and there's tissues going out, and, and all of a sudden, I was getting invited to speak to help people raise money for the Red Cross, and that's how it really started. Is all of a sudden, that's how I could raise money for the Red Cross and impact somebody. So I went to Gail McGovern, who was the CEO of the Red Cross nationally. I told her, I said, I want to raise money in every state for the Red Cross, because one of my goals is this. This miracle goes to every state in this union. So everybody gets a little benefit of the Red Cross from that day. And right now I'm in 40 states. I've got a few states to go. But that's why I do what I do for the Red Cross. And my goal is to hit all 50 states, and now I'm in Canada. Wow. Speaking for the Red Cross in Canada. And that's truly a life-giving mission. It's blood. It's, it's blood, but it's money. Because there's disasters happening all the time. Mm -hmm. We just got through the disasters over in Tennessee with the wildfires. <sighs> now they're having wildfires out west. We just had the flooding. I was just in Missouri last week. Well, they had the flooding from the river. It's all, I mean, I saw it. I went over Truman Lake, and it's all the way up to the bridge. So I got to go raise money for the Red Cross in Missouri for that certain disaster. That's the, the joy I get to have. Absolutely. I get to help raise money for people who are, who are in a desperate situation. Have you done Georgia yet? I have not done Georgia yet. Georgia is one of the few states I have not done, amazingly. Okay, Georgia. Yep. <laughs> P.S. Yeah. I can hook you up if, you know, so yep. let's make that let's happen. Let's make Georgia happen. This is, this is a layup. <laughs> hey, this is a, come on. This is a layup. <laughs> um, <laughs> is it true that Tony was the only person to call you in the hospital after the flight? That's true. He, um, how that's, and I actually wrote a blog about that last week. I never told the whole story until last week. So what, what happened was I was, I was on first class flights because you know, I was flying so much I had, had first class privileges. So I was on a first, I, wore, I had my Tony Robbins security jacket with me. And you know, in first class they checked the coat for you, right? Mm -hmm. So. But I took an earlier flight, took flight 1540. I was on five o'clock at first class. So I had to go back and coach. So I had to manage my own coat. So I put it underneath the seat. So when all this breaking out, the first thing I grabbed after I got my wallet in my pants and I grabbed my coat, because I knew it was 11 degrees, I had my coat on. But when I got to the triage center, they stripped all my clothes. I didn't have any clothes left. They took everything. And so what happened is my friends from Tony Robbins got with Tony, who was in Palm Springs at that, at that time. It's heading to Vegas, before he went to Vegas, he said, did you see, what, see this? They showed him what was going on, so he said, find him. And of course, he has considerable resources. He can find anybody he wants. So he called me about midnight that night. And I just told him, first I said, Tony, I appreciate you calling, but I just want to let you know, they got my jacket. So if your company gets any calls, this is what it's going to come from. And he starts laughing, he goes, I'd be honored to answer the question. And so he was the only one to call. My company didn't call, but Tony Robbins called. 
and we spent maybe 15, 20 minutes on the phone talking, and he was sort of prepping me what to expect. Right. You know, I've never been through this. He's never been through this. But he's been around enough people who've been through life-changing experiences to give me guidance on what was, I was, going, was going to transpire. And when I was telling him the story that night, he showed a video, part of the video, it's on YouTube, you can see it, people crying, hearing it. This is firsthand four hours after it happened. Raw. 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 And so uh, he was the only one to call me that night. That's why I have such an affinity with Tony. You know, such close friends. Huge, huge. That's yep. a testament yep. to his character. And um, yep. I, I have goosebumps. I don't know yep. if you can see them, but they are. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I believe you. Yeah. <laughs> I believe you. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about um, just the story of that day. Um, if it is something you like to talk about or are comfortable talking about, it's not, uh, you know, a, a PTSD yeah. type of thing. Um, you're 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 on a plane. Back in coach. Back in coach. Doing my thing. Doing your thing. Yep. Tell us. So I was reading a magazine. But, you know, basically I didn't pay attention. Like most people on planes, I didn't pay attention, mm -hmm. which has changed dramatically since this. So uh, why were you in coach instead of first class? So I was on the first class seat on the five, uh, five o'clock flight. Uh -huh. But since we got done early that day, mm -hmm. we got done 10 o'clock that morning, uh -huh. I caught the earlier flight. The travel agent put me on flight 1549. Uh -huh. So that's why I believe I was supposed to be on that plane. Yeah. So, but there was all first class was already booked. Right, okay. So that's, when, that's why I went back to 15A, but mm -hmm. you know, that was you know a pretty good seat for not having any yeah. first class seats. So. Yeah. That's why I had my coat back there. Mm -hmm. I would have never had my coat if I was in first class. They would have taken my coat. Right. Right? Right. So all these things are amazing. All these things sort of put together. But <coughs> Excuse me. But um, it was about 60 seconds after we took off and I heard a loud explosion. And came. I never heard anything on the plane like that before. So it sort of got my attention. So I looked up and I, I was in 15A. So I looked out the window. And all of a sudden I saw a fire coming out from the left wing. But, you know, I fly a lot. And I know planes have multiple engines. So I said, okay. The guy blew an engine, he's going back to LaGuardia. No big deal. It didn't startle me at all. But that's, I tell people, that was, that was really the saving grace of that day because no one on the left side of the plane knew that the same thing happened on the right side of the plane at the same time. See, I think if we would have heard boom, boom, there could have been a lot of panic on that plane. Oh my gosh. But you heard boom. So people on the plane thought, okay, there's another engine. And he's banking, so he's going back to the airport. So I think that was part of the saving grace if you heard one explosion. And that's how ironic. It's, it's a one in a billion shot that you have this many birds hitting a plane at the same time. That's one of the things that doesn't get talked about a lot. I think that was a part of the saving grace because no one panicked because everybody thought, okay, we got the other engine. Until he started banking and all of a sudden you saw water and all of a sudden you see the George Washington Bridge and he's descending and he's only about 400 feet above the bridge. Now the bridge is roughly 600 feet up. So he's roughly 900 to 1,000 to 1,100 feet at that point. And so when we were crossing the bridge, you look out the window, and obviously people's faces are looking up at you. You can see people's faces in their windows looking up as the plane is descending over the bridge. See, the thing he doesn't get credit for enough is clearing the bridge. I tell people the skill he used that day was gliding. Everything else, power of focus and all this, that's good stuff. But his gliding experience, which he learned at the Air Force Academy, just think if he didn't go to the Air Force Academy. He didn't learn that experience. So, but as he cleared the bridge, that's when he said his magic words, brace for impact. And no, no one on the planet heard before. And if you saw the movie Sully, that's the moment where everybody got quiet. It's like, okay, this is serious. I mean, because all, all, all you can see is water. That's it. You have no place else to go. And the only thing I could think about water is, I just remember planes tipping on sides. And, and Tony gave me this, he said, just think if he missed this thing. If he just tipped it, we, all of a sudden the, he's going, the plane's going through Manhattan at rush hour, this could have been bigger than 9-11. But he managed it and he hit it perfectly. But that was part one. Part two is getting out. Because water started coming in immediately because the way the hit it on the bottom, it stripped the bottom of the plane. Somebody tried to open up the back door, which they did exactly what they were supposed to do, they thought. But you're not supposed to in the water because the plane is like this. So now water's coming in from the back of the plane. So water's about knee deep immediately. So now you're trying to get out of the plane. And it is cold. It's 36 degree water. It's cold water. But you got adrenaline at this point. No one's feeling the cold just yet. But so that's, that's the moment where I was like, okay, get to the aisle, get up and get out. Like I said, I wasn't resourceful. I was like, get to the aisle, get up and get out. When I got to the aisle, something changed everything for me at that moment. That's when I think everything started changing from that, that one moment because 
my mom, who had passed away in 1997, started talking to me. And I, what I heard her say is, if you, do, if you do the right thing, God will take care of you. Seeing the right thing for me was, I grew up, you take care of other people. I was in Boy Scouts and always with teams where everybody's had everybody's back. So I went towards the back of the plane to see if anybody needed help. And once we got everybody out, I started making my way out. Now you're about waist deep in the water now because you're now about two, three minutes into this thing. And, you, and the bins are broken open, luggage is floating in the water, so you couldn't see where you were going. And all the further I could get up was 10F on the right side. When I got my time to go out, right, I looked out, there was no room on the wing or the boat for me. That's why I was inside the plane for seven minutes, waist deep in 36 degree water, holding on the lifeboat because there's no room on, for me on the wing or the boat. And that's, that's how it really started breaking out, but still, things are happening. And all of a sudden, I felt a shimmy in the plane, and when I found out later what it was, is a tugboat that was coming out, hit the front of the plane as he was backing out because the next boat was coming in, he was backing out, and it just took a shimmy, all of a sudden I felt water go up my back, and the first thing I thought about, I mean, I remember it was like yesterday, Titanic. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I could think about is when, the, when that boat stuck up, it sucked everything down with it, and my first thought was, don't be sucked down in a plane. So that's when I jumped in and swam to the closest boat, which was the end of the wing, but now I gotta get up, to, get up the ferry because I had an orange plastic ladder like you saw in the movie. And I had to climb and I can see how I could climb but then my mom, I heard my mom's words, there's no such word as can't, right? I got one arm up, I got the other arm up, people grabbed and threw me on the ferry. That's how I got off the plane. But then I went to New Jersey and that's when things started to change again. Because when I got to New Jersey, there were three people waiting for me. There were two EMTs and a guy from the Red Cross. And that's how I started my Red Cross experience. Yeah because there was three people who were waiting just for me. I couldn't walk, so they picked me up and carried me to a room, to a triage center. And they took all my clothes off down to my underwear. And all of a sudden, my, Heather, my EMT, tells me, I'll be right back. And I don't even know what's going on. I'm in the floor in my underwear, I look over here, and this guy's sort of like I am, this little girl, didn't have any underwear on, but everybody's like looking, and it's like, what's going on now? But, but then a guy comes walking to me with a card in his hand, he said, I need your name, I need your date of birth. And he writes on the card, he takes my right ankle, and he walked away. And the only association I had to that was MASH. When I grew up, then they tagged your toe, you were dead. So I was on the floor, I was naked, I could barely breathe, I had a tag on my foot. I was like, maybe, it's, maybe that movie Ghost is right. Maybe I am dead. Maybe I'm just watching all this play out, right? Maybe I'm dead. And that's exactly what I thought. I was like, okay, I didn't make it. I'm just sitting here on the floor. But then, then Heather comes back, she's like, I gotta take your blood pressure. I was like, good. <laughs> But then it was 190 over 120, and then she said, we gotta go right now. Because you could have a heart attack or stroke, you gotta go out of here right now. That's when all of a sudden, they got me out. It took me to the hospital, and that's when everything started changing at the hospital again. I'm shaking, I don't know if you can see. Like, can you see my knees are shaking right now? <laughs> Your story is yeah. so powerful. Just in the retelling of it, I'm, I'm shaking. I, can't control it, but now I'm using the power of telling yourself, like, you are okay. That's right, internal dialogue. Calm down. Right. This is your autonomous, <laughs> autonomous nervous system, yeah. you know, flight or flight syndrome, right. responding to such highly charged emotional data. Um, so I'm taking some deep breaths and refocusing because this is just so mind blowing. Um, what is your mother's name? Irma. 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 God bless you, Irma. Yeah. For, for teaching Dave and his siblings uh, that you absolutely yep. can. Can't is not an option. Can't is not an option, not a word. Which is really challenging when you have kids because you tell them that and they don't believe it. No, they don't. They don't believe it. <laughs> no, they do not. So you gotta give them, you know, you gotta give sort of pounded in like my mom pounded it in. Right, and give them, give them manageable increments of right. showing them how they can. Um, yeah. Because something that we talk about here are the four C's formula, um, the courage, capability and eventually um, you realize you can do it and then that gives you ec incremental power to do it again on a much larger scale. Um, so Dave, now that your life has been changed and you are not um, dealing with PTSD but PTGS and you have this platform, um, what's next for you and how can everyone out there watching help you and pour into you to help further your mission. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm honored to be here with you today. I, you know, I get to go to a lot of different venues and share this in a lot of different ways. Being able to have a, like just a one-on-one -on -one conversation, just really getting down to it, means a lot because a lot of people don't know the backstory. I talked earlier about the backstory. Right. 
And I tell people the back story is probably more interesting than the real story a lot of times. And so the things that I've learned is what I write about now. So where I'm going next, I just did a TED Talk. It's called Bouncing Back on TEDx. And it's about PTGS and these strategies that I use and how you can employ this and how you can actually grow from a traumatic life events that go into a depressed state. And anybody can use these things. It's not new knowledge, it's just no. employing the knowledge. So I share that in my, one of my new talks now, the longer talk is I talk in more depth about these, these experiences and how you can grow which I'm really honored to do. I did it last week at Rosecrans Air Force Base over in Kansas, outside of St. Joe, Missouri. It was an honor to be with the Air Force and their International Guard sharing this strategy. So that's really a direction I'm taking. I'm developing some products around the book because what people keep asking me is for more information. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I talk about is, we talked about today, is sensory acuity. Yes. Well, you know, people can see me live, they can see me on video, they can read the book, but I want to be able to share this auditory. So I'm doing a, an audio series basically from each one of these chapters, and I pick out a master for each one of these chapters, which I'll be interviewing about focus, yes. about persistence, and how this person mastered that in their life. I've got some people that we, people will be blown away by who have agreed to do this. You would never hear about. But these people are truly successful in their life because they've employed this and become geniuses in this one area of their life. So that's my next project. And then I'm going to be putting another book out about PTGS and how to grow. That's, a, that's the next project. So that's sort of where we're going to be rolling out over the next several months and just trying to speak as many places as I can. And I just hit the $9 million mark with the Red Cross. And my goal now is to get to $10 million. And that's my next goal with the Red Cross. So anybody can help me get to Georgia, these other nine states, would be really appreciative. Yep. We, we yep. can help with that. I am confident okay. of that. Um, so we will pop up links to, to buy your book, you. to follow your blog, um, to help the Red Cross, um, you po your podcast as uh, well. Yep. Um, are you on Twitter? Are you on social media? On, on social. <laughs> yes, I'm now on social media. It's Dave Sanderson Speaks on Facebook. Okay. It's Dave Sanderson 2 uh -huh. on Twitter. Okay. And David Sanderson on LinkedIn. And my, my, my social media manager, Denise, make sure I repeat that every time. So yes. Thank you for asking of me. Of course. And you helped Denise out today. Yeah, Denise, we will pop those links up as well so you can just click yeah. and, and follow thank and connect. Um, Dave, it is such an honor. I am so moved. Um, by your story. I'm thankful for this time I got to spend with you. I'm thankful that you are here Thank you. today and um, wish you all the best. But God in the bless future. you too. Thank God you. Bless. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>